Sumaher here at the Anthropology Department uh, talking about her ongoing research. This is a, a, a long-term project that she has been working on with uh, people from the University of Tulsa, as you can see here on the front page. And I know we're going to get a lot of good imagery from what she's been engaged with and what she's finding. So I'm going to let her speak. She obviously is an assistant professor here and been here for five years. Yeah. And came from the University of Cambridge Toronto, uh, working in Paleolithic uh, scholarship linked to settlements. So that's a thing. And you can see that a little bit in her title, uh, Persistent Places or Occupying Wide slash Wild Open Spaces, question mark, uh, Alternative Pathways to Neolithicization, I'm not saying that right, in the prehistory of the Near East. So please welcome Professor Thank you very much. Um, I also have idea if that's the correct way to say that word. It's a term I hate very much, um, which is why I kind of want to talk about some issues around Neolithicization um, in the Near East. Uh, as Christine mentioned, this is a project I've been working on for a number of years with colleagues at Tulsa, my co-director um, at the excavation site I'm going to talk about today is at the University of Tulsa, but it includes people from many, many other institutions. Um, so I certainly don't want to give the impression that this is a one or even a two person show. It certainly involves many different people. So what I thought I would talk about today, since I realized that I think it's been three years, two years anyway, since I gave a brown bag talk, um, I wanted to give a little bit of background to the kinds of bigger pictures, uh, bigger picture questions that we've been looking at as well as some of the newer field research um, and analyses that we've been conducting. So some of you have heard some of this in, some of this in one form or another, um, and then there'll be some new information added here and there. So I will go very briefly over some aspects of what I will show and talk about, and then take a little bit more time in some of the newer stuff that we've been working on. So, some of the, the kind of key themes of this research project, which is, if I go back for a moment, uh, the little logo in the top center, EFAP, the Epipaleolithic Foragers and Azraq Project. Epipaleolithic is a horribly cumbersome word to say again and again and again in a talk. So I may inadvertently short form it to Epipal or EP, um, which you'll probably see throughout the text of the presentation. But this is a large project that's based around a number of research themes, which I have listed up here, which include trying to understand human environment relationships. Um, so trying to put together a reconstruction of what the landscape in Eastern Jordan, so this project is based in Eastern Jordan, look like and how it's changed over the last 20,000 years, but focusing in on kind of the first 10,000 years of the last 20,000 years. So from about 20,000 to 10,000 years ago, to say simply. It includes a lot of geomorphological, hydrological, um, and micromorphological work, uh, the latter of which is my, my specialty. Um, in particular, we're trying to relate these past landscapes to issues of hunter-gatherer activities in that 10,000 span, year span of time in Eastern Jordan. So thinking about things like aggregation and mobility, interaction networks between this particular site that I'm going to talk about and surrounding contemporary sites in the region. And then thinking a little bit more specifically about um, particular aspects of material culture. Um, I will talk a little bit more about stone tools because it's what I happen to work on uh, most. Um, but there are other uh, related aspects of the analysis of archaeobotanical material, faunal material, marine shell, which we find a lot of at the site, that I'll touch on a little bit that revolve around these same themes, um, which include trying to understand various aspects of prehistoric technology. Um, and when it comes to the chipstone, thinking about uh, things like communities of practice and the role of different napping traditions and the way in which those traditions are taught or learned by members of um, the site itself, the one I'm going to talk about today, but also the larger region. I also just came from three hours of lecturing before this, so we'll see how my voice lasts. 
So one of the key themes um, that I've been working on and working on quite a bit in the last uh, couple of years with our dear colleague Meg Conkey is thinking about some issues of hunter-gatherer landscapes and particularly hunter-gatherer um, house and home or whether or not, and we would argue yes, these terms can be applied to hunter-gatherer groups in the same way that we very comfortably apply them to later Neolithic farmers, particularly in the Near East. So talking about hunter-gatherers as having um, homes and built environments on sites, but also thinking about those more broadly in terms of regional communities and interacting communities. Um, so we've uh, actually borrowed some ideas from other researchers working on similar things in other parts of the world, including Michelle Langley's work talking about um, understanding both social landscapes, so the interaction between people across a very large uh, geographical space, but also thinking about how people react and interact with particular aspects of the physical landscape itself and how entangled those things are. Um, so this is actually an illustration, a reconstruction of trying to think about those things at Harana that was done by a previous student of mine um, here a couple years ago. One of the really key aspects of this work that um, Meg and I have been thinking about and particularly and are trying, to, trying desperately to finish a paper on is thinking about the use of the terms houses versus huts, um, in particular how they are used in the Near East um, as well as, for, for Meg's case, the Upper Paleolithic in Europe. In particular, in the Near East, we very comfortably call Neolithic villages communities. Um, people build houses. These houses are aggregated together into these rather large settlements and communities, whereas we tend to be much more conservative in the use of these terms in the Epi-Paleolithic. Even when we have sites that have clear built structures, we shy away from imbuing these with anything more than simply kind of being a shelter from the elements. And so this has kind of caused us to, to think more particularly about this idea of house and home and community at a particular site, in my case at Harana 4, the site I'm going to talk about today, but also thinking about these concepts more broadly in the landscape. So whether or not we can use these terms to think about hunter-gatherer communities, not just at one site, but over a larger area where we see clear evidence for the movement of people and the trade and exchange of goods between sites. So thinking about questions on a site, such as do activities in public versus private spaces reflect changes in the way people are interacting with each other, particularly at the aggregation site I'm going to talk about today, where we think we have hunter-gatherer groups coming from a large area not just immediately around the site, but a much larger area, aggregating up the site and interacting with people that they are probably not regularly interacting with in other times when they're not at the site. And then thinking about whether or not we can track some of this social interaction in the broader landscape. So the goal is what we have called peopling the Neolithic. So thinking about how we understand communities, who is coming to the site Harana 4 that I'm going to talk about? Um, are these communities changing over time? And then how does this fit with what's going on in a pretty dramatically changing landscape uh, at the end of the Pleistocene and into the beginning of the Holocene? So to give you some geographical context here, I am focusing in on Southwest Asia, which is actually a quite broad area, includes a number of countries. Um, but in particular, I am zooming into Eastern Jordan, this area over here. So this is the Mediterranean Sea. This is the island of Cyprus. Here we have the Red Sea. This is the Dead Sea. Um, this is the Sea of Galilee. And we're actually working in what is today a very dry desert environment in Eastern Jordan. And if we zoom in here, this dashed area is the Azraq Basin. So the larger regional project looks at a number of sites from about a 10,000 year span of prehistory in this Azraq Basin. Um, but the site I'm going to talk about in detail today is located right here in the western portion of this basin. And it is marked here by the star. One note that I want to make, which is of relevance for the map I just showed, 
but also for trying to understand hunter-gatherers or really any groups in the past on a landscape, which is that our contemporary archaeological practices are very much colored and molded in various directions because of the geopolitical situation in the Middle East, which we're all very aware of in the news today. Um, so we have countries like Jordan, which itself has very, very bizarre borders, um, things that were entirely created by um, Winston Churchill, actually, um, in negotiations of carving up much of this part of the world. And research has very much stuck to these borders. Um, so for example, we know a lot about Jordan, Israel, West Bank. We knew a lot until 2010 about what was going on in Syria, particularly southern Syria. Um, work in Iraq has been halted for quite a long time. It now seems to be picking up again. And so what we can understand at any given point in time is kind of piecemeal depending on where it's possible to do research. But it's important to keep in mind because these are modern geopolitical borders, of course, and have little bearing on our reconstructions in the past. However, even archaeologists tend to extend borders or create borders back into the past. So this is a map, um, that a very recently published map, I should add. Um, I won't name the colleague who published it. Um, but it shows that this idea of kind of carving out borders or boundaries um, as kind of confined spaces that people would have moved within is very much uh, apparent in the archaeological record here. And so frames a lot of how we think about things. The Epipaleolithic is, as I mentioned, a 10,000 year span of prehistory. It runs roughly from about 23,000 years ago, where we have the Upper Paleolithic beforehand, to about 11,500 years ago, the end of the Pleistocene. We very broadly divide up the 10,000 years of the Epipaleolithic here abbreviated EP, I think throughout the rest of the presentation it's probably mostly abbreviated, into early, middle, and late phases. And we make a distinction between these three phases based on a whole variety of types of material culture differences, but primarily, even still, um, changes in stone tool technologies, where early epipaleolithic groups make these very kind of narrow, gracile uh, microliths, so very small stone tools, that's the kind of characteristic feature of the Epipaleolithic period. So making stone tools that are five centimeters or smaller in size, hafting a whole bunch of them together to make one larger composite tool. The middle Epipaleolithic with somewhat larger geometrically shaped microliths, usually in the form of trapezes or rectangles or triangles or something like that. And then the late Epipaleolithic with these very small characteristic crescent-shaped pieces. So those are our very broad, very basic definitions um, to distinguish between these three phases. However, if you're an EpiPal researcher, particularly a lithics person, um, we can get into a whole other conversation about how each of these has been subdivided into a whole series of local um, and geographically distinct entities and chronologically different um, industries, entities, facies, that are based primarily on stone tool differences. The site that I'm going to talk about, Harana 4, fits in this time period right here, predominantly early Epipaleolithic, but also into the middle Epipaleolithic. And in fact, this uh, background diagram is a little bit old um, and out of date. This boundary should actually be shifted earlier in time. So we have both an early and a middle Epipal component. We, in this project, were particularly interested in the early and the middle Epipaleolithic because this is the time period when we are supposed to have, according to conventional frameworks, very mobile um, hunter-gatherer groups, what we would call in very traditional hunter-gatherer terminology, simple mobile hunter-gatherers, in comparison to the late Epipaleolithic, which are often, um, however inappropriately, compared to uh, hunter-gatherer, complex hunter-gatherer groups, for example, of the northwest coast of North America, where they show increases in sedentism um, and a whole variety of other uh, apparent changes in material culture, which I've just shown here in a number of diagrams. 
Um, however, the more we excavate these earlier sites, the more we see that a lot of these features we can find much earlier in time. I've already given you a little bit of background on the project, so I'm not going to go into any real detail here, um, except to say that the excavations that I'm going to talk about today are part of a larger uh, epipaleolithic and forager, epipaleolithic, see, it's very difficult to say, foragers and Azraq uh, project, which includes not just the site of Harana 4, but a whole variety of sites um, focused on a couple of key issues that have to do with hunter-gatherers and changing landscapes and those interrelationships. The larger area that's covered by the project is the Azraq Basin. It is a 12,000 and a half a square kilometer area in eastern Jordan. So actually here's a better image of the, uh, base, the boundaries of the basin itself, which are basically mapped onto the Azraq drainage basin, which is a series of, and you can see them in the satellite imagery here, a series of uh, seasonal rivers and channels and streams that flow centrally towards the Azraq oasis, which is located in this area right here. The site that I'm talking about is located further to the west. The Azraq Oasis used to look like this. It was a very lush area, lots of water available year round, and it was a, a big focus for migratory um, terrestrial and, and waterfowl um, that would travel through the area. Nowadays, it does not look like that at all. This is the little bit of water that is left. Um, instead, and we don't have to worry about this top illustration, this is the wetlands today, a much smaller area than it once was. Um, basically, the basin all drains toward this uh, oasis, the kind of central lowest point in the larger basin, um, particularly rainwater and shallow moving groundwater that comes from the Jebel Druze, the mountainous area to the south, which is in um, northern Jordan, but particularly in southern Syria. So it's supposed to feed the wetland, but it's actually now diverted both before it gets to the wetland and at the wetland itself to supply fresh water to urban areas, including Jordan's capital, Amman, um, as well as a number of agricultural fields. Here is the area around the site. Well, this is actually the site here. Um, and this is what the landscape looks like today. This is one of these seasonal rivers that I was mentioning that flows towards the Azraq Oasis. Believe it or not, it actually does fill with the winter rains. It's just those rains are not coming as often and as in abundance as they used to. And in fact, this water no longer flows all the way to the Azraq Oasis because the Department of Agriculture built a large reservoir, water reservoir, to capture all this water, just about 200 meters in this direction. Um, we had to convince them to move it, not to destroy the site. Um, this water is for migratory, uh, well, Bedouin who are moving their camel and sheep herds um, between Eastern Jordan and areas in the highlands further to the west. <coughs> this is zooming out, um, taken from a helicopter, uh, so an aerial image of the site of Harana, which is this darkened area right here. You can see some of our trucks um, as we're driving towards the site here. So to give you an idea of what the landscape look like, looks like today, and this is an a image that was stitched together from some aerial drone photography we did over the site in 2015. You can see very clearly this uh, river, this is the Wadi Harana, Wadi is Arabic for a seasonal river, um, that flows towards the Azraq Oasis, or used to, until it now gets caught in a reservoir that's right about there. The area of the site is really quite notable. It's really a huge site um, for this time period. It's 21,000 square meters in size. Um, it's also incredibly dense in material. So it has this dark color because the surface looks like this. So it's just paved in flint um, and animal bone. Um, and in fact, there are images. We took these uh, drone images and you can actually zoom in and see individual artifacts on the surface covering this entire surface um, and also a similar density of material at depth. Um, so we have about a meter and a half to two meters in some areas of equally dense material below the surface. Um, so the reason the site still exists in this environment is because deflation has eroded an unknown portion of the uppermost levels of the site. Um, 
at least a few centimeters, if not more, created this really dense pavement of material and then protected everything below from further wind erosion. Our big questions are why such a huge hunter-gatherer site here in what is a very desert environment today, and what types of occupations would have created such an archaeologically rich site. So, and I'll go relatively briefly over this, some of uh, our work to address the first question, why here, have been to try and understand um, and reconstruct the changing paleo environment. We suspect, not any great leap of logic, to think that the environment today was nothing like it was in the past, um, and it was very, very different in order to be able to support such a large site. And so we've gone about work on site and off site to try and document these environmental changes. Um, and you can see some of the areas. This is the site right here. So a topographic map showing the mound, which rises very gently, although it's actually the highest thing in the surrounding landscape. But it rises only about a meter and a half to two meters above the surrounding terraces. We've been working also at many of these terraces to try and understand um, both how the site has both formed during occupation, how it's been preserved, but also how it relates to how the landscape's been changing in these surrounding terraces. So we've done a lot of mapping and a lot of coring and um, trenching of areas on site, including right here, um, as well as off site to try and get a sense of what, uh, how these areas relate to each other and what we can document of the, the paleo landscape. One thing that was immediately apparent, both on site and off site, are these very, very distinctive deposits, which you can see right here, marked um, by this whitish area, which is calcium carbonate, which is precipitated out of uh, standing water. So these are actually ancient lake deposits that have now dried up. And we find them both off site, so this one comes from right here, as well as on site. So the very base, the earliest levels of occupation at the site are actually found in these lake deposits. At periods when the lake levels were low, people were occupying this area. When lake levels rose, they were not. And then when they would dry out again, people would come back until the lakes had receded enough that people stayed put on site and they were adjacent to the kind of new, slightly receded shoreline of the lake. And you can see there are actually several post holes that are dug into these lake deposits. We've done a lot of uh, sedimentological and geoarchaeological work on these deposits on site and off site to try and track what conditions would have been like. I won't go through all of these um, in, in detail. What I can say is our particle size analysis here is showing area A is on site, area B is off site, or sorry, area B is also on site, and then this lighter color here is off site. So our deposits very generally on site are a little bit coarser, which is no surprise. It reflects the anthropogenic, anthropogenic input into the sediment. Um, it also changes things like magnetic susceptibility. They were <sighs> building a lot of fires on site, burning a lot of things, and we see that reflected in the very higher, much, much higher magnetic susceptibility readings that we get in our on-site areas compared to our off-site areas. We also see notable differences in other types of um, and other elements from the site versus off-site, which include primarily evidence that the lake deposits were uh, freshwater deposits um, and contain a really high content of freshwater uh, ostracods, which can give us some information about uh, environmental conditions and the type of water, whether it was standing water or flowing water, um, and we actually see both in our on-site deposits. We can put together this information from on-site and off-site and kind of map out these sections. These are the site deposits here, these three dark bars, and then our off-site stratigraphic sections. We have water and elevation decreasing, basically downstream heading eastwards towards the Azraq Basin, or sorry, the Azraq Oasis. Um, and we have dates, I haven't put all of them on here, um, but you can see our dates line up relatively nicely. So our sections surrounding this site where we get these lake deposits, because um, they're mostly what we've been able to date through OSL dating, um, give us dates of around 20, 21, 22,000 years ago. And then we have occupation of the site starting about 20,000 years ago, um, but slightly more recently as this 
lake is drying out, people are basically living on its edge. Oh, and so we have the site right here. You can see it sits as a slight mound in the surrounding landscape and evidence both underneath the occupation deposits but also in the surrounding terraces for the presence of these lakes, but we use the term lake very loosely. They're probably more like wetlands, actually, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we know that um, as we go through. Our excavations on site have focused in two areas mainly, although we've done test trenches in various other areas, including a long geological trench to try and match on site and off site deposits. Um, we focused in these two areas because it's where the previous excavator, the site was excavated with two very small test trenches in the 80s, had found some interesting things that we wanted to continue to explore. So we've opened up a much, much larger area. Just to give you an idea of what it's like working there today, um, we now have a lot of Bedouin who bring their camel and sheep herds by the site going to visit this new reservoir. Um, we work in the hot sun with lots of sand. Um, it's usually very windy when we go in the spring. It's a little bit too hot to go later on. We start, this is actually uh, about seven in the morning, so by about seven it starts getting really, really, really hot. Um, and in the spring the wind picks up, so try as we might to have shade tents over our excavations, it just does not work. We have, yeah, lost a lot of money trying to buy shade tents. Um, the one very fortuitous or fortunate thing for us in this now dry desert landscape is that it has been like that for about the last 17,000 years. And in fact, the drying out of this part of the Azarac Basin is one of the reasons why this site was abandoned about 18,000 years ago, a little bit more. So this very nice dry desert environment has been great for uh, charcoal preservation, which means we have a really good record. Uh, chronological record of occupation of the site. So from our earliest deposits going through, this is actually two sections put together, um, our early epipaleolithic deposits here and our middle epipaleolithic deposits here, which has this very lovely sequence of the lowest ones are the oldest and the uppermost ones are the youngest, something that doesn't usually always work out so nicely. Um, and you can get an idea, this is one of the sections that we collected all of these dates from actually. Um, and charcoal is so abundant at the site that in order to get dates from this section, we really just have to pick them out of individual contexts. Um, we have hundreds and hundreds of samples, more than we will ever, ever be able to afford to process unless a lab decides to do everything for free. So here's what some of the early epipaleolithic deposits look like. So we have this really high resolution stratigraphy. Another fortunate thing of rapid burial in a dry desert environment is that we have really good, well-preserved um, stratigraphy, including individual hearths, ash dumps, occupation services, even alternations between these. I'm not sure how well you can see it in the lighting, but we have several alternating layers of orange, kind of compact earthen occupation surfaces, these gray lenses of ash dumps and then orange compact surface ash dump and so on and so forth. Um, as well as this dark stain here which we uncovered while re-excavating the original trench that the earlier excavator dug um, and we're very interested to figure out what it was because it's the only really massive thick black deposit we have in the entire site. It's really really organic rich, it's absolutely full of um, burnt organic matter, particularly charcoal. When we then exposed that area, what we discovered was a uh, trace. We caught the corner of it right here. So this is the original excavator's very small trench, um, which the borders, the borders of which we are mostly sure about, but not entirely. All we can say is that we found a Mountain Dew bottle at the very bottom, um, which he very kindly tossed in. Um, so, and there was also uh, a human burial that came from his trench, although we don't know exactly where. The best we can reconstruct from his notes uh, is that it came from this corner of the bottom of this trench. So it's only a, it's only a one by one trench, it wasn't a massive thing. Um, and uh, it came from somewhere below that dark layer that I mentioned, which is actually the superstructure, the burnt down superstructure of uh, hut one that we've labeled here. Um, further, we've now fully excavated hut structure one um, and discovered that there's actually another hut structure here partially superimposed on top of it. And 
most recently, um, including this past summer, we excavated uh, parts of structure two, which you can see is about a meter to a meter and 20 um, away. I'm just gonna, uh, there we go. I'll just go do that. So what's been really interesting with this hut structure is not just the fact that we have multiple hut structures preserved. Um, there's only one other site in this part of the world from the EpiPal that documents this. Um, they also had three hut structures. We, I think, have a fourth one, but we haven't excavated there yet fully, so I'm not sure it's where those post holes were really down deeply that I showed earlier. Um, what's really interesting about this hut structure, as well as the ones that were found at the other sites that I mentioned, Ohalo 2, is that they show a really interesting sequence of activities associated with their construction, their use, their reuse, and then their eventual abandonment. Um, and in fact, intentional destruction. So this structure right here, we excavated um, in 2013 primarily. Coming down on this structure, it was delineated very clearly by an orange, a very bright orange sand. Um, and it was the only deposit in the entire site that did not contain any artifacts. So it was a very intentionally placed deposit. It follows exactly the boundaries of the black layer that was underneath, which represents the burnt superstructure of the hut. It's basically nothing but charcoal and really burnt organic matter. Um, so uh, kind of partially wood, branch, twig um, superstructure and reed superstructure, which I'll talk about in a moment. However, underneath that sand, before that sealed over the burnt superstructure, we had placed on top of that black layer a large anvil stone, which you can see here, and then several caches of marine shell and red ochre. Um, three distinct caches in particular, each of which had about 500 or so pierced marine shell, um, and each one of which had a large, you can see one large chunk here, one large chunk here, and one large chunk here of red ochre, and each chunk is kind of about that size. So it's not ochre that's forming naturally in the soil. Isn't enough water to do that anyways. Um, something that was brought into the site and placed on this, this superstructure. I should also mention, in case you didn't gather from the maps earlier, that we're about 200 kilometers away from, God, I've been here for five years and I can't make that transition to miles. I'll just go with kilometers, 200 kilometers away from the Mediterranean Sea and almost 300 kilometers away from the Red Sea, which is where most of the shell is coming from. Below that superstructure, which again only follows the boundaries of the floors below it, so not an accidental fire that kind of spread through the area, but something very deliberate and circumscribed to the hut itself, we found three superimposed floors. Um, each one had a little bit of kind of loose fill in between, but more importantly, or more interestingly, I guess, each of these floors had a lot of material that seems to have been intentionally placed on it, and very specific material. Things like bone tools, um, caches of flint cores, or caches of just blades, um, or fire cracked rocks. We don't actually have any evidence for hearths inside, instead we have a hearth outside of the hut. Um, and uh, marine shell, and I'll show some of that, some, some of those images in a second. So if we kind of look at a, a cross section of the structure, it's kind of dug slightly into existing occupational deposits. We have, oh, I think I did this, there we go. So we have our, our kind of orange ceiling deposit on top, which had some pieces of natural burnt uh, flint that were probably placed on the organic a superstructure that was burnt down and then the sand placed on top. We have our caches of marine shell, which were definitely intentionally placed on the superstructure. And then we have things like articulated vertebrae, five of them, of a wild cow, so wild cattle, um, which you can see right here. Large pieces of ground stone and bone tools that were placed on the first floor. And then second floor and third floor, which look very similar and also have equally interesting things placed on them, which I have images of in a moment. And we've actually piece plotted all of this out to try and look at differences between not just stone tools, but everything that we find on these floors. Um, and I'm going to go relatively quickly through this part. Um, my colleague at the University of Tulsa, who is a useware specialist, has looked in detail at the stone tools in particular 
trying to understand if we have any differences either between floors um, or between what's going on inside and outside of the huts in terms of the types of stone tools that we find, but also what they may have been used for. Um, so she's been looking at things like edge damage, striations, polish, that sort of thing, to try and identify them to particular activities or materials that they were used on. So as projectiles, cutting, scraping, drilling, and of course there's always a large category of unknown, uh, particularly when it comes to use wear analysis. So you can see a lot of pieces used as projectiles, so have these very characteristic impact fractures along their edges, as well as cutting and scraping. What is particularly interesting um, when we map out, so I've taken out all the objects and you can just see they're them represented by what they've been used for, is that we have almost no microliths inside of the hut structures. And if you remember what I said earlier, microliths are like the tool for the epipaleolithic. So over 60% of every tool assemblage for any epipal site, it's kind of the criteria, is microliths. And we have none of them inside of the structures. Instead, we have huge numbers of them outside of the structures. What we do have inside are butchery and hide processing tools. Um, but obviously no clear indication of kind of spatial segregation in the use of those tools. So still a lot more to do on that, but some really interesting padding, patterns that are coming up um, in the way that these uh, structures are being used in comparison to the spaces outside of the structures, and even on a floor by floor basis. In 2016, we excavated a second hut structure, um, which you can see here as we were uncovering this uh, kind of dark, burnt, organic uh, superstructure part, um, which we didn't get very far in excavating uh, because what we did find is um, a human burial. So uh, an adult individual here, which was placed on top of that burnt superstructure. Uh, or sorry, underneath that burnt superstructure. So the burnt layer actually covered this individual and they sit on a very compact um, floor deposit. Well, I say floor, but we actually haven't excavated the floor yet. So obviously floor deposit underneath. Um, so it seems very clear and the bones are also quite extensively burnt. So it seems as though this person was placed on the last floor of the structure, which was then burnt down and, and sealed over with this person um, still there. So a very intentional marking of the end of the life of this structure as well as the, the other one. I mentioned we were finding really interesting things inside of the structures. Um, we are finding on some of the floors things like marine shell, not only in the caches that I mentioned, but we also find them isolated in caches with other things like red ochre and flint. So this is, these are all little flints right here, which is actually a core and all of the blades that came off of that core. Um, that were all put together in one of the floors. And then we even find uh, kind of linear arrangements of shell, which obviously the string isn't preserved, but we suspect um, represents shells that would have uh, originally been strung together. We find a lot of bone tools, which is really interesting because we almost never find bone tools outside of the hut structures. Um, but we have from each floor, we have you know 10 or 15 bone tools, um, which is per floor more than we have for all of our contexts in this area outside of the structures. And then we find that they're doing really interesting things with animals, um, not just inside, but outside as well. In particular, inside of the structures, we find things like burnt uh, gazelle horn cores, uh, tortoise shell, tortoise uh, carapaces still articulated together here. And in multiple instances, sometimes several of them on one floor, we find still articulated uh, fox paws. Um, in some cases heavily burnt, but in some cases not at all. I would love to be able to tell you what that means, but I have absolutely no idea whatsoever. So it's ritual. Uh, if I come back to this very briefly, what I uh, want to add is um, something that I've been working on recently, which is uh, looking in detail at the, the sediments, so micro scale analysis of um, the deposits from each of these floors uh, in the hut structures. Um, and what we can say very comfortably, even if we don't know what it means, is that the placement of these things on each of these floors is not just they have been abandoned and, and moved on. So you know, they're very intentionally placed, there's some fill placed on top of them, and then a new 
uh, floor is placed on top of that, and we have that at least three times in hut structure one. When we look at the floor deposits and the fill, there's basically nothing of the same size as the stuff that is sitting right on top of the floors. Um, so it's not just you know, digging up occupational deposits from elsewhere to use as fill. So it's a very intentional placement with then material that has basically nothing in it as the fill in between. Um, and we can see it's the only slide I have that has artifacts of any notable size um, from one of these floor deposits, because usually we try not to sample where there's lots of artifacts, because it means you're not really looking at much soil. But you can see here four uh, circular bone beads, which have been broken, um, that sit on, so this is the kind of burnt layer here. There's a large piece of flint right here as well um, that are sitting on the uh, uppermost floor deposit. We also do find interesting things, but in a slightly different context in the spaces outside of the structures. In particular, in that meter or so space in between hut structure one and two that I talked about, um, which include this very large hearth. Um, this is my collaborator at the University of Tulsa, and this is another collaborator who's at, at Copenhagen, excavating one of these hearths, where again, we find tortoise shell. Um, and around the hearth and in other areas in between, we now have four examples of uh, these burnt gazelle horn cores, which are still attached to the frontal bone of the gazelle, and they're standing straight up in the deposits. So you can see other examples of that here, and in fact, also a large cache of uh, ibex and gazelle horn core, um, this time not standing up. We also have a lot of caching of other things, um, including, in this case, the four articulated paws of a fox, a red fox, um, which had a large, uh, partially reduced core inside, which our faunal uh, specialist, Louise Martin, who's at UCL, is reconstructing as being the handles for a fox pelt bag. So the pelt is obviously decayed away, um, but the handles, uh, the bones would have provided um, easy carrying handles and would have carried things like a couple of these flint cores. And we also find caches of uh, cores with all of the associated debris, including the tools that have been removed from them, sometimes also with the inclusion of, of bone tools. So really interesting things going on, of which we're still working on what to make of it. The other main excavation area where we've worked is a little bit more recent in time, um, and I'm going to mention it only very briefly. Uh, what we find here is a very <coughs> different scenario. So in the early EpiPal levels, we have a lot of discrete activities. We have these caches, um, discrete spaces and circumscribed spaces like these hut structures, whereas we don't have any of that in the middle EpiPal levels. Instead, we have kind of bigger open spaces. We have a lot of hearths and a lot of post holes um, that are, are uh, dug into these kind of large, open, compact, probably earthen surfaces. Um, which we think actually represent outdoor activity spaces. They would have been more communal spaces, so there's no uh, clear you know, separation of who would have been moving through these spaces. Um, and we find ridiculous amounts of uh, gazelle, so partially articulated, heavily processed in some cases. Um, so our, uh, our funnel analyst and our student have been working on the material, particularly in these spaces, and are interpreting these as being kind of outdoor uh, areas for large-scale food processing, more than could ever possibly be consumed in any one, any one sitting. So we have these layers that are basically nothing but bone, um, particularly gazelle bone, other things as well, but particularly gazelle. Um, and then all these post holes are usually aligned around hearths, so probably representing either roasting or, or smoking or something to perhaps preserve these gazelle remains. Um, our most recent work in this area has also uh, been able to locate an early epipaleolithic layer below the middle epipaleolithic. Um, so at first we thought occupation was kind of segregated into two areas, over time obviously, so early in one area, middle in the other, but we can now see that in the early epipal and the middle they were occupying most of this 21,000 square meters of, of site. So it's not that we just have some you know, partially overlapping occupations, but we have this large area that would have been occupied. We have a lot of marine shell from our middle epipal areas as well, even more so than in our early epipal areas. We have marine shell now in the thousands, so we have 
probably close to 10,000 um, shells, which is by orders of magnitude more than the marine shell from every other contemporary site put together, even those right on the coast. So we have really a lot of marine shell and a lot of things like worked bone, worked stone, um, and uh, bone pendants that you can see here. In the last few minutes, um, I'm going to just go through, I'll probably skip over a lot of this. This is the part I'm not going to talk too, too much about. Um, go over some of the analyses that we've been doing, including looking at the marine shell, which I mentioned is coming from the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. So from pretty vast distances to the site, we're doing some work right now on looking at, uh, obviously, the identification, but also some isotopic work to see if we can get in any information. Um, some of these shells are found today in both the Red and the Mediterranean Sea, but obviously these two bodies of water have very different isotopic compositions, so we should be able to track that out. Um, when we do that work, that's being done by a colleague at Tulsa. Um, but if we very broadly, with the understanding that we have a lot of material coming from both of these seas, um, so some we can definitely say come from the Mediterranean, some definitely come from the Red, some come from either or both, um, but it's clear that they were using multiple uh, sources for this marine shell. And so our question is thinking about whether or not people are either coming from Harana, going to the coast and back again, or people from the coast are coming to Harana, or you have some kind of down the line trade. Um, but it's very clear that huge numbers of shell are making it to the site. And so we could think about you know, this idea, this is borrowed again from, well, me directly from Meg, but Meg from uh, idea uh, from the Upper Paleolithic of Europe, this idea of all the social activities that might come along with aggregating in one place and bringing things like marine shell that you can trade for other things. So a shell fair, shell bead fair such as this. We've looked a lot at the stone tools. It's our most abundant artifact type. Um, it's what both me and my colleague at Tulsa uh, work primarily on. Um, there's ridiculous amounts of stone tools from the site. I think we're, we we're at well over 4 million at the moment. Um, so we are in the process of gathering slews of graduate and undergraduate students, including Felicia, to look at some of this material. There are clear differences between what's going on in the early and the middle EpiPal. I'm not going to go through all of this. Um, what I just want to point out is that the differences are not just in the final tools that I showed you at the beginning of the presentation, but in the whole process, the technological knowledge um, and traditions that are used to produce these stone tools. Um, and in fact, there are not just differences between the early and the middle, but there are clear differences within each of those time periods as well. Um, so whether or not they're putting a lot more effort into preparing their core or maintaining it along the way um, gives us some pretty important uh, information as to kind of the learning process of making stone tools and how that may be tracked in space, as well as the final tools that are produced. So we, you know, we've looked at some differences between the early and the middle epipaleolithic. What I want to point out for relevance here is what we find in the middle epipaleolithic. So in this time period, we usually um, think of the entire area of the southern Levant, of this part of Southwest Asia, um, as being occupied by different hunter-gatherer groups who each made, the, each made their own kind of type of stone tools. So you find the people who made the triangles in the Jordan Valley, and the people who made the trapezes in the south, and the people who made the rectangles along the coastal plain. Um, but what's interesting about the tools that we find at Harana is that we find all of that variation at one site, including some others that are only found at a few sites in the Negev, for example, or up in um, what is now Lebanon. But we find that whole huge range of material at Harana. We've done a lot of raw material survey uh, around the site itself, and we know that the wide variety of raw material, material that they're using to make those stone tools is all local. So we can source it all to within about 20 kilometers of the site. Um, but all of these kind of regional variations come from much greater distances. So what we think is happening is that people are, rather than lugging big nodules of flint with them to come to Harana, are just bringing the knowledge. So there are flint knappers who are coming to the site. And they're actually collecting the material from around the site and flint knapping on site. Um, and you know, probably interacting with each other and you know, these kind of fluid and changing you know, nap-ins, we would call them today. Um, 
to produce this wide variety. So it looks like a kind of unique site. It often gets called a very unique site because of the very different assemblage of stone tools we find at the site. But it's actually probably because it's a blending together of many different local traditions as people are aggregating there. And then I just kind of mapped this out uh, to give you an idea. So, you know, all our particular trapeze-like pieces come from sites near here. These very distinct denticulated pieces come from the western Negev, and, and so on and so forth. All right, I'm not going to spend much time talking about the other types of analyses. Um, it's all still ongoing. It's basically all gazelle at the site in terms of the fauna. It's well over 85% of our faunal assemblage in any context, sometimes as high as 95 in others, like this, these large kind of communal gazelle processing areas. But the other key thing to keep in mind is there's a huge variety of other species as well, including very water-dependent species. Gazelle are not water-dependent, um, but wild boar, which we have quite a lot of, wild cattle, um, tortoise to some respect, and a lot of waterfowl that we have at the site. Um, also give us a good indication that it was a quite well-watered environment. The gazelle are both sedentary and, and migratory, um, so there were always gazelle around the site, but at particular times in the year there would have been obscene numbers of gazelle around the site, and people clearly took advantage of that. So that might have been one of the reasons for, for aggregation. I won't go through all that stuff. We're now doing isotope work on the gazelle. Um, and we just had a paper come out in the Journal of Archaeological Science, which demonstrates that they were hunting gazelle year-round. So it doesn't mean they were occupying the site year-round, but there was at least some part of the population that was hunting at the site and hunting gazelle on a year-round basis. And in most cases, within one stratigraphic context over multiple seasons. A lot of archaeobotanical material, um, the uh, charcoal and other uh, seeds and macro botanical material uh, gives us a good indication of there being at least some stands of, of things like wild almond around, which again also require water, um, but a, a very much a, a mm -hmm. kind of brush-like mm -hmm. landscape, not a lot of, of trees. But our phytolith work, um, and again we just had a paper come out a few weeks ago in PLOS One, uh, we did very detailed mapping out um, and collecting of phytolith samples from within the hut structures and then deposits outside of the hut structures. And so we know that they were using a lot of things that haven't really preserved very well organically, but preserve in terms of their phytoliths, like grasses and reeds. So we have a combination, and I can scoop to here. So we have a combination of um, wetland, which is this uh, uh, blue, bar here with you know, some small amounts of wooded areas and heavily grassland areas. So there was a kind of wide range of ecologies available to the people, but they were certainly heavy, heavily exploiting, particularly for the construction of these huts, um, these uh, uh, wetland resources. And so rather than the way it looks today, it would have looked probably something a lot more like this. I mentioned human burials. Um, this, we found one in 2016. There was one excavated, uh, I mentioned, probably from below our first hut structure. So uh, interesting that people are burying individuals on site, particularly in association with these hut structures, something that we don't normally mark until much later um, in the Neolithic period, where people are very frequently buried underneath house floors. Um, so we're kind of arguing with all of this combined evidence that we have a, a, you know, a pretty clear aggregation site that we could actually call a community, and even a community in the very kind of flexible Anderson sense of the word, where people would have been interacting directly at Harana, but probably would have also been connected to, maybe not directly through personal contact, but through trade and exchange, or even just kind of down the line knowledge to other people from a larger surrounding landscape. So rather than having all these individual sites as dots on a map, and this is something Meg and I have both talked about in this context before, um, we can actually map out different artifact distributions and start to track paths along the landscape. We can put um, things like fauna that people would have also been attracted to and probably tracked on the landscape themselves. But of course, people never move in straight lines. And in fact, you can't possibly move in straight lines in this landscape. 
Um, so we probably had something that looks totally crazy uh, like this, which much better reflects the reality of what hunter-gatherers were doing on the landscape. Um, and it's not just Harana that shows evidence of this, even within the Azraq Basin. There's another huge uh, aggregation site only 20 kilometers away that was occupied at the same time. So Harana is not unique in many, many ways. Um, there's clearly very interesting things going on in that bigger hunter-gatherer landscape. But rather than being this kind of eastern periphery desert area, which it often gets relegated to at the moment, it was a very busy place in the Epipaleolithic. And just to prove my point, a few years ago, they put up this very nice welcome to Azraq sign. <laughs> and so we have evidence now for, for these kinds of things, kind of substantive uh, investment in the site, reoccupation of the site, and use of this kind of wide open space, um, because it probably was not nearly as wide or as open as it looks today. And I'm going to skip over that, because it's time to go and do the very important acknowledgement slide, which is to say thank you to not only all of our funding bodies, but in particular, all of the people that we have worked with in the field, including especially the local communities in Azraq that we work with quite a bit and to many of my colleagues here. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, of course. Great talk. Uh, Thanks. One of the questions I had, you talked about the huts and the excavation and the early ET period. Mm -hmm. And basically, you're talking about how the lithics are very different than those outside the house. You're talking about you didn't find very micro lithics. Yeah. So you did find them outside. So, what, what's the difference? And what, what were they doing outside with the micro lithics that made it so different? From right. The well, themselves? yeah, we can't really say for sure at the moment, in part because a lot of this analysis is still ongoing, especially the sure. material outside of the hut structures. But we can suppose or or think about, you know, if uh, part of the idea is that we have people coming to the site from a, a kind of larger geographic space who are doing different things in terms of making stone tools. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, it, making a scraper is kind of making a scraper. Just end scrapers on blades all kind of look the same. Um, and we see that, well, we see that through, I mean, uh, Meg and I could compare end scrapers between Europe and the Near East and they'll look mostly the same. Mm -hmm. um, but there's kind of some, some style in making these microliths. And whether or not those relate to function is a whole other debate that's been rampant in the, and it seems that they don't. So our use of our analysis doesn't show that any particular type of microlith is used for any particular type of task. In fact, most of them have overprinted use wear of many different types of tasks. Um, so it seems like, and Ofer Bar Yosef would be jumping for joy to hear me say he was right. <laughs> But I think he was right. The style actually means something socially, at least to some degree. Um, so I think you know, if this idea of people aggregating there is true, then you can process hides in, in your you know, own structure in the privacy of a particular place or do whatever kind of domestic things you need to do. But if you're making stone tools, particularly actually really sharp pointy microliths, a, it's probably better to do that outside for very practical reasons. Um, but B, if you know, part of the thing that happens when you get together with these people is you share that knowledge, then you would do that in a more open, gotcha. open space. Yeah, but again, I can't prove yeah, that yeah, at the moment. So. Right. Yeah. Nice. yeah, sorry, at the back first, and then well, David. Uh, you would cut down a tree with a jackknife, so you don't seem to be getting uh, tree and branch we, well, we have tree and branches represented in the charcoal, so they're getting access to it somehow. We, you know, it's not well preserved enough to see if they're, you know, getting what's already dead and fallen down or whether they're harvesting it themselves. Um, but we do have large tools that could do the job. I just haven't talked about them very much. But they're, they're there. They're not abundant, but they're there. Yeah. But again, use wear isn't showing evidence of them being used to cut down trees. So it's, yeah. More, more work is needed. <laughs> yeah, David. Um, thanks for the talk. Really uh, the micro list assemblages that you showed, I thought were really fascinating. And thinking about um, you know, your argument for community, I was wondering if while you're seeing these kinds of different styles, are you at any point seeing any sort of blending of, blending of 
any of these styles, uh, maybe different material use in a, in a style than traditionally found, uh, any sort of technological change that might suggest sort of an emergent community or a yeah. So we think we might be seeing a little bit of that in the middle epipile deposits. We don't in the early at all um, so far. But uh, we actually just put in a grant application to try and address that exact question, kind of going the next step in, in figuring out whether or not we can actually track different social groups and where they would have been in one particular occupation part of the site. Um, in the middle epipile areas, we do see some things that uh, you know, a, a denticulated piece that has a hook on the end, where you don't usually find those at other sites. But we don't find them in great numbers. So we, we, and we haven't excavated a huge amount. We have a lot of material, but we honestly haven't excavated a lot of the site. You know, we've excavated, I think we calculated, 0.005% of the site. Um, so it could still be there. Um, so we have a lot more work to do on whether or not we can identify this idea of kind of blended traditions, because that's kind of the logical thought is, you know, if you're sharing knowledge of how to make stone tools, then you would you'd expect to see, you know, hybrids. Um, people used to call this site really unique because they said it had these variants. And in fact, there was a book published recently by a person who worked on the lithic collections in the 80s um, from the original excavations. And he actually named an entire lithic industry based on what's at the site. Um, but you can find everything that's at the site with the exception of two or three pieces that look like some mixing um, of a couple of different traditions from different geographical areas. You can find everything else in different areas of the region. So, so there, aside from a few instances, there's nothing really new at Harana, so, which I, I, I is not probably the thing you're supposed to do when you start working at a site. It's not unique, it's not particularly, you know, <laughs> this is just what people were doing. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Christine. Um, you showed the plants at the end, and uh, you, have the, um, you have the wild moment. There, was there any hackberry or any evidence of mountainous with all those, you know, with wood, so much wood, yeah. all shrubby shrub local, and there's no evidence that they were bringing stuff from mountains? Not so far. It would be really far to bring. I mean, you'd have to go to the Jebel Druze. Okay. So there's nothing even remotely mountainous anywhere closer so than that. So they're building huts, how are they going to get big enough pieces of wood? What's so, uh, well, I think a lot of it is, is small branches and twigs, very much like the reconstruction they have at, at Ohalo. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not big, it's really not big pieces of wood at all. They're, they're really kind of brush structures and reeds. So I think a lot of the actual covering is reeds. That's, by and large, the phytoliths from the hut it's very structures very are. Dense in the, yeah. Around the house, that yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Houses. yeah. Houses. How is this? Oh, How is this? Huts the whole time I know, I do it yeah, by default. But, but they're houses, yeah. So, well, I would say, you know, when I'm describing the morphology of the structure of it, then I would call it a hut. But in terms of what people were doing socially, it was a house, it was a home. Yeah. Ruth, yeah. Turn? Yes, your turn. Thank you. Um, I know you've only, you haven't excavated many houses or homes or whatever you want to call them yet, but um, it seems to me that you're kind of moving towards thinking of these houses in terms of an approach that uh, is like the used life or life history mm -hmm. of the house. Very much, yeah. And um, you're bringing in that whole concept of some sort of ritualized or end or specific event at the end life, end mm -hmm. of the use life. I'm wondering how you're going to fit that into this whole idea of aggregation and sedentism. Because it looks to me, you know, these could be quite short term, mm -hmm. set, uh, short term houses. Do you have any kind of Thinking, yes, yeah, well, in part, you know, so our, our next step in terms of understanding the relationship between the hut structures and then thinking about people coming and going um, is to try and sort out um, whether or not, at least to the best that we possibly can, whether or not they're contemporary. Um, and looking at, so getting good dates from each of the floors. So, in fact, uh, your visitor, Chris, has been looking at some of the 
the charcoal remains from inside the structure. So we can try and submit those and get and get good dates of the deposits within the structure and see, you know, what's what time span do we have between our three floors, for example, or between the top floor and the burnt layer above it, um, and see if that might help us address some of those issues. The length of time. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And you know, I've said we have three. We have probably a fourth. I suspect there are a whole lot more that we just may never, even in my lifetime, get to excavate. But what, so, so, so where does that leave us with? your idea about the segregated site? Uh, it, well, it, it, I think it leaves us better evidence for this in the middle epipal deposits than it does in the early epipal deposits. Because in the early epipal deposits, where we have the huts, we still have pretty clear segregation of activities and you know what people are doing and where they're doing it. Um, but in the middle epipal deposits, where we uh, have really thicker deposits, we can actually try and use things like sedimentation rates, although there's all kinds of issues with that, um, and, and good programs of radiocarbon dating to get nice sequences that might tell us the duration of any of these individual contexts. Um, so I think we're going to be able to first make a better case for that in terms of relating site formation processes to occupation, but you know, duration of occupation is... So without duration, are you going to make any... I'm just pushing you to, yeah, yeah, yeah. to say something well, not oops. quite anchored in the empirical data. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, I think with the, the arguments that we have on particularly the isotope work we're starting to do with the fauna, which actually gives us good indications of seasonality, um, and putting that together with uh, the stone tool work that we're doing, um, once we can get a lot more of the middle epipal stuff done, we've hardly touched that material at all. We still have so, well, we've analyzed 150,000 pieces, but we've hardly touched that material at all. Um, you know, once we have a little bit more of that analyzed, then I think we can say a lot more about um, ideas of aggregation mm -hmm. um, by, by breaking them down in this you know, these small contexts that we do have preserved at the site. So we, we're talking very broadly, and what I've talked very broadly here, because it's what we've done so far, is what we see in the middle epipal area and what we see in the early epipal area. What we're doing now is breaking down what's in each of these individual contexts in all of those areas, because it's the only way that I can foresee we can address that, that issue. Okay. Yeah. So back to my more work is needed. <laughs> Jin, did you have a question? Well, I think it taps into what Ruth was pushing on. And I guess one of the first slides I saw an agglutinative, and then and you're talking about aggregation, and then in the southwest we talk about accretional constructions or settlement structures, right? And so those were agglutinative, accretional aggregation. Um, as you just worked out potentially empirically in the future, you know, sedimentation rates might tell you something about that, potentially better. Uh, yeah. Um, but I'm the geoarchaeologist and I'm very skeptical about the possibility of sedimentation rates for addressing oh, this issue. That was actually what I originally wanted to talk to you about was that that wadi flowing right by it, right? I was like, hey, you know, this thing's gonna sometimes jump its banks, it's gonna change course, you know, the the that beautiful oasis picture you have in there, like where does mm -hmm. that fit in? You've got these calcium carbonate layers, so I'm going, well wait, couldn't we know something about that if you're saying the sedimentation rates are right, you're highly skeptical. Just because it's, it, there's so much unknowns with such an eroded landscape. Yeah, we, we got nothing, no vegetation anchoring anything down. Yeah. So. And water itself is containing like this, the silt rates don't contain any sort of colloids mm -hmm. that would then bind bullcrap. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, a big, well, it's a big battle. So I think, you know, looking at the on-site deposits where they are kind of anchored down and preserved, and trying to pick apart every bit of information we can from the very well preserved stratigraphy that we have is going to be our best, yeah. our best bet. Yeah. And now I'm just going to be total you know, speculation here. And you mm -hmm. have a thought, Miles, but it's a long answer. Uh, you had posts, you had burning, you had bone beds. Right? Yeah. How bad are the flies when the water levels are higher on there? Oh, they're bad even when the water levels are low. Okay. So. <laughs> And then how much like fire cracked rock and like heat altered 
um, shirt is there at the post holes with the lung beds? Uh, so the post holes are usually filled with uh, charcoal, but highly fragmented, and burnt lithics. Um, one of them, which is actually really interesting, I will go back to you just to say as a total sidebar, and then I'll come back to your question. So in one of the post holes, we found a large nodule of flint. Oh, there we go. Right here, which I know you can't see very well. I will do this because it's totally relevant to what I want to say. So this nodule of flint, ouch, right here, um, which is, you can see this is a five centimeter scale, so it's you know kind of that size. It was jammed into vertically into a post hole, one of our post holes that was dug into the lake sediments. And um, if you can see here, it actually has red ochre staining all along one edge, and a little dip down here, a little dip down there, a little dip down there, and a little dip down there. So I think it was held with someone who had red ochre all over their hands, and they left their handprint on it. So what you can't see on the other side is that there's a, a large area where a palm would go, um, and then a smaller stained area, which might be where a thumb goes. Um, so. In some instances, the post holes are clearly also being cleaned out, and other things are being, being stuck into them. Oh yeah, it would have been terrible. So smoking would actually be super clutch, yeah. right? Not yeah. just for the butcher, but also for when she's later, or he's later, you know, working out how to preserve the meat, like you were saying, mm -hmm. right? The and we, you know, we have these, I call them bone beds, but they're more like pits. So they were digging into occupational deposits, dumping all of the you know, carcass debris and bones. In some cases, they're not even very heavily processing gazelle. I mean, they were probably like swimming in gazelle. They were bringing the entire carcasses back. They didn't, I mean, gazelle, you just sling over your shoulder. You don't have to process them in the field on the fly. Um, and in fact, Another thing that we, since I'll go into the realm of speculation here, another thing that we, I've been talking to our funnel analyst about that we suspect is this area is known for these um, stone-made desert kites, which are these massive features on the landscape that um, were used to corral gazelle. Yeah, So the gazelle just kind of follow them naturally. Well, there's some speculation as to whether or not they were used for gazelle that early. They were certainly used for things like onager. Um, but the idea was that they kind of funnel a herd of gazelle, and then at the end they have blinds, so these stone-lined yeah. areas where they're captured and then killed. Yeah. We don't have, and those, that's in the basalt desert. We're just outside of the basalt desert. So we don't have the limestone rocks uh, resources just on the ground surface to make that kind of structure. Right. But there's tons of grasses and twigs and branches. So you could make a brush version of that. Um, so I think where we have communal processing, we probably also had communal hunting. And the, the mortality and sex profiles of the gazelle actually suggest that in the middle, middle epipal levels. So it's all adult males in the early epipal, all predominantly. Um, in the middle epipal, it's everything. You know, young, juveniles, infants, uh, Males, females, adults, young, it's just everything. Um, so I think they were doing communal hunting and communal processing, particularly smoking. They were digging these big pits, dumping the carcasses that are not even extensively processed, um, covering those up, probably, so they don't stink. <laughs> yeah, they're very wasteful people. Unless they're just cutting off the meat and smoking strips of meat, right. which is probably what they're doing for gazelle. Yeah. yeah. So, so our, you know, uh, the cut marks, which are everywhere on the carcasses, um, but not as extensive as you would expect. So they're not heavily processing. They're not snapping stuff open for marrow. Um, they're cutting off meat and strips of meat, drawing and smoking those, and then. And that's why we get still partially articulated carcasses in the pits, because they're not pulling everything apart, and they're not smoking stuff on the bone. Are they using the bone for fuel at all? Uh, we don't have good evidence of that. We don't have any kind of massive pits of burnt bone. Um, but they're using the horn cores. They slice off the end of the horn cores, and they use them as soft timer percussors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you think the uh, change in climate Exactly coincides with when 
some discussions say that the ice age essentially ended because the rotational north pole shifted in the direction of Siberia from in the direction yeah. of um, Greenland, that area, and that the whole planet changed. And what melted was North Pole ice that was no longer within the rotational Arctic. And that's, you know, toward the Americas, whereas in Siberia they find mammoths with fresh grass still in their mm. teeth. So that it all would have happened real, real fast. Well, I mean, yes and no. So that process started about 25,000 years ago. That, so that's the last glacial maximum. And then you know things are, are pretty cold and dry, as they are here. They warm up a little bit um, around 16,000, 17,000 years ago with something that we globally call the bowling alarod. Um, there's a whole bunch of smaller phases of cold, arid periods in that. But we don't track them all in the Near East because we're not a glacial uh, environment, uh, but you can track very well in Europe. Then around 12,000 years ago, 11 and a half thousand years ago, uh, massive meltwater input from North America, like Agassiz is created, it changes the whole global circulation of, of ocean currents. Yeah, so that's the Younger Dryas, that input. So that's a really rapid cold and dry period about 11 and a half thousand years ago. And that we definitely track in this part of the world. Um, and people have argued and continue to argue about whether or not that was a push towards EpiPal groups becoming farmers and so on and so forth. Yeah, so that's one of these uh, warming periods, um, which, so, What's really interesting, and I didn't have a lot of time to talk about it um, because I always talk too much about this stuff. Um, at this area in, in the Azraq Basin in eastern Jordan, the local climate record, so the microclimate here, is very, very different than the rest of the southern Levant. So our models that we make, which are really regional models, don't apply to every different part of that region. And they don't apply to the Azraq Basin. So things are getting warm and wet elsewhere in the southern Levant, which is where you start to see an expansion of hunter-gatherer groups, more sites expanding into new areas. But in the Azraq Basin, it, things are getting warmer, but it increases uh, evaporation rates of any standing bodies of water. So it's drying out those lakes around the site, dries them out almost completely, or actually really completely, by about probably 16 and a half, 17,000 years ago. Even the oasis starts to shrink, and we can track that in the work we've done, the geological work we've done in the oasis. So water is just shrinking. It's warm but dry in the Azraq Basin. The change, the change in the ocean's level, um, I've seen a good discussion of the Persian Gulf and how much of that was at one point in time regular farmland or you know regular um, whatever. And um, I've never seen anything that shows what happened to the Red Sea during that time. But there is like this migration into Egypt. So there might be a lot of. Right, but the, my, my point is that it's the, the effects of that are very, very different when you go to different right. localities. Right. Yes. Yeah, I heard yeah. That, I heard, yeah. yeah. I was just saying though, so. that, that there is a traceable study of the Persian Gulf mm -hmm. that in the changes of the ocean level arises. Yeah. Yep. They are right. Those those things are right. Yep. Yep. I've seen them. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I was going to ask about the, the the other large sites in the fire. Are people doing comparable work? And can you the lot you mentioned? Gelat six. Gelat yeah. Two no, there. they excavated a two by two meter trench right. in 1988, and no one's done any work there before. Or after, sorry. Do you have a sense? Are they similar? Are they like all clean? We think it. Yeah, we think it's exactly the same. Um, so I worked very closely with the person who worked in Gillette before we started to work on this project. And the reason people don't dig them is because they take up your entire career to dig. <laughs> so it's no small investment to, to dig one of these big sites, as we are discovering. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's another one that is kind of ready for the picking if someone wants to work there. But, but very little has been done. So they've really extensively looked at the material that was dug up in the original trench, but no new work has been done there. 
And I think the X-Ray would be very happy if a new project started there. Are they around the same water body? No, no. So they're in completely different, um, well, they're 20 kilometers away and separated by a small upland area, which is really not much at all. You d drive over it comfortably in your truck. Um, so they're in different watersheds within the same basin. Yeah. And that Gillette still has water, actually. Yeah. yeah. So of course it's interesting that the minute you have something that you can identify as a structure, right, is that it allows you then to start thinking because of our cultural biases that <clears throat> that we could call those a home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're small. So really, when you want to talk about sort of a home idea, it's really not focused on the structure, mm -hmm. but it's actually struck more on the, on the site and what is going on around mm -hmm. it, and that that has the persistency of uh, use, visitation, symbolic loading, and all those other things. Yeah. Right, but it makes people very, um, if you tell them, oh, well, those huts are so small, how many people do you think could get inside them? Oh, I think probably it depends on what you're doing inside, right. but you know, well, we can fit five people in them to dig, so but, up. but you no, down. sitting down. Yeah. yeah. But no, not lying down. No. Maybe three people lying down. Yeah. Yeah. Cozy. Yeah. yeah. So, so they're not, they're not, they're, they're not sleeping inside. inside. We don't sleep inside our house in when we're in the field. Yeah, right. So I certainly wouldn't presume they were sleeping inside theirs either. Well, they're not just storing well, things either. Not, no, but they're not cooking in there. They're not cooking in there. So they're doing, they're doing something in there. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't want to cook in there because it's all real. No, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. It'll catch on fire. I think, you know, for the, the activities where you might want some kind of shelter, wind like breaks. when it's windy, exactly. Yeah, but they not be just windbreaks, so they have to have roofs? Uh, well, they, I don't know how they would stand up if they well, didn't have... It's possible. So they just use sticks and then lash twine, you know, rows of reeds and lash it to that. Yeah, I mean, they're it's encircled. Really they're, yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're encircled, but it's entirely possible they don't have roofs. So I have no investment in what they would have looked like. I don't think we know enough information about that yet. It's entire, or they had some kind of hide that might have been just spread over. The only thing I can say is if they were just walls, we can't keep metal s structures up in the wind so there. So, and again, very different environment 20,000 years ago, so it may not have been the same type of windy uh, environment in the spring, but yeah. Or, you know, it gets really rainy at certain times of the year, so even something that, you know, you could kind of duck into, or you want to do something private, you don't want other people to see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, just then just reads, right. yep. Yeah. Although, you know, woven together tightly, they're quite waterproof yeah. reads. <laughs> Those micro lists are good for scraping this side of the hive, because you've got to clean it up, you've got to clean all the view off, you've got to clean all Well, the, the micro uh very rarely show evidence for scraping, but we do have scrapers that they clearly used. Things we typologically call scrapers that were clearly used for scraping activities. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Well, thank you. Thank you.